Well, we are in the last Sunday of Epiphany, which in the church calendar year is called Transfiguration Sunday. Uh, Transfiguration Sunday is a Sunday that anticipates the season of Lent, a season when Christians uh, prepare themselves for the events of Holy Week and Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, it might seem strange to be thinking about Jesus' glorification before his passion, but there's good reason why the feast is put here in our lectionary reading. Uh, For one thing, the story in the synoptic gospel, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, took place before Jesus' passion. And for another, the feast is put before Jesus' passion to help us wake up from our sleep to wake up from our sleep before we enter into a time of repentance, a time of renunciation during Lent. Before we do all that, we need to first wake up spiritually. Listen to him. Get up. Do not be afraid. Listen to him. Get up. Do not be afraid. Words that I hope will help us wake up. Because if there were ever three words of instruction or command or promise Jesus gives us that we Christians need to hear right now as we are about to enter the Lenten season, it's probably these words. Now, just to set the scene before I read you the text, because we skip a few chapters of Matthew. Usually when the calendar shift, we'll have a couple of more Sundays after Epiphany, but we only come to the seventh Sunday after Epiphany, and so we skip a lot of chapters in the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel that we are going through this year. So this takes place six days after Peter's confession. Peter's confession that Jesus is the Messiah. You remember that confession. And then Jesus rebuking Peter's misunderstanding of what it means to be the Messiah. And so after that, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up the mountain. And we come to the story we're about to read, Matthew 17, verses 1 to 9. And as usual, after I read, I will say, this is the word of the Lord. And if you're open to receive it as the word of the Lord, please respond by saying, thanks be to God. All right? So Matthew 17, 1 to 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down to the mountain, as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Like the song that we sang earlier. What privilege it is to see you with these unworthy eyes. Yet you always make us worthy by your love. And so this Transfiguration Sunday, as we enter into a new season in our walk with your Son, we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, the words that we read will not just become words, but they will be living word an encounter with the living word himself that has the power to also transfigure us from glory to glory. For his glory alone we pray and give thanks. And all God's people say, amen. So on this mountain, he is 
transfigured. That is, his appearance literally changed right in front of Peter, James, and John. That is that while they recognized their Lord, they recognized their friend that they had been walking with, they also perceived his heavenly glory in a way they had not before. Moreover, he's joined by Moses and Elijah, the symbols of law and prophets, the symbols of the foundations of Israel's faith. Now, remembering what just happened six days before, when you think about it, this was an emotionally charged time. Why? Because I suspect that Peter has alternately felt thrilled by the reception of his confession, you are the Messiah, and then hurt by Jesus' rebuke, get behind me, Satan, and confused by what Jesus is saying, that he will be given to the powers to die. And then, of course, uncertain about the future, about their future. And now, dazzled, perplexed, probably more than a little overwhelmed, but also perhaps excited to be at this place and time and witness this marvelous event. And so in trying to make sense of what's happening, Peter's mind goes back to the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Dwelling. And wishing to pay appropriate respect to these guests, Moses and Elijah, Peter offers a tabernacle for them, offers to make a dwelling place for them. It's a confusing time. It is a heady time. It is an exciting time, and it's also in an uncertain time. And so I'm not sure Peter knew entirely what to make of it. I'm pretty sure that I don't either. Because the whole transfiguration event can be a little hard to interpret, a little hard to make sense. Now, if you were here last year, or at least join our online service, The emphasis in our lectionary reading last year from Luke's version is this idea that the glorified and transfigured Christ is the prototype of our own creation. That transfiguration is our prototype in glory. And that is why the story last year includes Jesus healing a demon-possessed boy to point out how our condition is some distance away from glorified and transfigured, from being glorified and from being transfigured in Christ. Now, in Matthew's narrative, the emphasis is that the transfiguration is a turning point, a metanoia, the time when Jesus, confessed as Messiah, revealed in glory, now turns steadfastly toward Jerusalem to offer a very different picture of Messiah and of glory, a different picture than anyone then or now expected, right? Even now, we still expect a glorified Messiah in an earthly way. We still expect glory in an earthly way, but not through the suffering and the cross. So it is unexpected. And when placed at this point in the church here, this reading links to three seasons simultaneously. It concludes the season of light, which we are in, the season of revelation, which we call epiphany. It signals the descent down the mountain and the road to Jerusalem that we travel in repentance and renunciation in Lent. And of course, it anticipates the glory of the Easter resurrection. Now, for all these reasons, we may, like Peter, not know quite what to make of it all. And so then we go back to various previous ways of interpreting transfiguration. That's what Peter did. Let's go back to tabernacle and make a dwelling for these two characters and you, Lord. We can make interpretation in light of Epiphany, in light of Lent, in light of Easter, in an attempt to at least observe the day appropriately, even if we don't understand it fully. Now, these are not wrong of course. But at this particular time and place, I would suggest making another move and allow the words spoken on that mountain to speak to us in this time and in this place. Because at some level, we are all dealing with a turning point 
in life. We all deal with a turning point. We are all dealing with change. And you and I know what that's like. We've all gotten up next morning after a major change, wondering what just happened, right? And what do I do now? Sometimes it was change that we wanted. And other times, it was change that we never wished or wanted. Sometimes we experienced the change as positive, as good. Other times, the change was painful and of a loss of something we valued or wanted. And whatever we see it as good or bad, desired or unwanted, turning point or change always comes with consequences, always comes with challenges, and always comes with questions. And so I suspect every one of us here could tell stories about the turning points that we have experienced, the changes that are happening in our life right now, or the changes that we hope for or that we fear might be happening. And so the question for us is that, how do we live in the midst of a turning point? What can we hold on to when it seems the world around us, as well as us, is changing? And I suspect the disciples in today's gospel might be asking the same kind of question. And if they too are feeling the wind of change blowing in their lives. And here's why I say that. Because immediately before Jesus takes Peter, John, and James up the mountain, he tells them and the others that he must suffer, die, and be resurrected on the third day. Right? And then he will tell them the same thing, that he must suffer, die, and be resurrected on the third day after they come down from the mountain. And so what happened on that mountaintop took place between Jesus' two statements of impending change. Maybe that event what we call the transfiguration, was actually about preparing and helping the disciples live through the coming change. And so maybe the transfiguration story has something to teach us and show us about how to face our turning points and live in the midst of changes. And so that's maybe that's why every year the transfiguration is the gospel we hear and the last Sunday after Epiphany, and the Sunday before the season of Lent, a season that focuses on change. Change, whether on the mountaintop of life or in the valley of the shadow of death, it is a reality of our life. It is a reality that we cannot escape. And so this morning, let's just unpack the three words of instruction or command or promise that Jesus gives to prepare us for our lives' turning points, for our lives' changes. The first one, listen to him. Listen to him. Now, one of the things I'm aware of in the midst of change is how many voices begin to speak. <laughs> I see that all the time. How many voices begin to speak to us? Some are outside of me, and some are from within me, right? There are voices of commentators, voices of influencers, chattering about what is happening and what should be done. There are voices of judgment, voices of second guessing, voices of fear. There are voices of self-doubt, self-criticism, voices of all the would-haves, should-haves, could-haves, right? How many of you heard that before? I have, many times. Some voices tell us to run and hide. Other voices tell us to fight and resist. There's so many voices. Some voices ask questions and want explanations. Other voices deny what is happening. Some voices blame or declare it to be the end of the world. So many voices cry out for attention. But not every voice is helpful or worth listening to. Some voices may sound sweet, but they're actually not good for us at all. And so the story of transfiguration says there's only one voice to listen to, the voice of God, 
the voice of God that speaks from the bright cloud, overshadowing Peter, James, and John. This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. And so what if in the midst of change, instead of paying attention to all those voices, we sought to hear and listen to the one voice that matters, the voice of Christ? What if we kept our ears open to what he's saying in our life and world today? To allow ourselves to become aware of and attentive to what he's saying and doing in the world. To let his concerns and desires become our concerns and desires. To let his way of engaging life and the world become our way of engaging life and engaging the world. To pay attention to what Jesus says and does, to whom he reaches out, and to those he gives attention and help. I think it would mean that whatever change comes upon us, it does not have the final word. There is another voice. Jesus is always speaking a word that is larger and more powerful than all the other voices that we hear. In the midst of change, Jesus speaks a word of life, a word of hope, a word of forgiveness, a word of mercy, a word of beauty, a word of generosity, a word of courage, a word of love, a word of healing. Jesus speaks a word to you and for you and for me. But the question for us is, are we listening to that word, to his voice? Listen to him. The second set of words, get up. Get up. I suspect we've all faced change that has caused us to stumble, that caused us to fall, right? Change that paralyzed us or change that left us overwhelmed. Again, this is not about whether the change is perceived as good or bad. Rather, it's about regaining our balance and getting up to our feet. It's about stepping into new life when we aren't sure what that looks like or if there really is a new life waiting for us. The three disciples, Matthew tells us, fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. And Jesus touches them and says, get up. But it's more than just get up. A literal translation would be something like, be raised up. Be aroused from the sleep of death. Or perhaps even be resurrected. The word that Matthew uses here is the same verb he uses when Jesus heals the paralytic, telling him, when when Jesus heals the paralytic, telling the paralytic, stand up. When Jesus takes the hand of a dead daughter of the synagogue leader and the girl got up. When Jesus instructs the 12, raise the dead. When Jesus foretells his own resurrection and the angel tells the woman who come to Jesus' tomb, he's not here for he has been raised as he said. Jesus comes to us in whatever circumstances of change we find ourselves, touches us and says, Get up, be raised, be resurrected. It's the promise that though life has changed, it has not ended. Somehow new life is hidden in the midst of change, even when we cannot see it or do not believe it. God uses the changing circumstances of our lives and world to bring us into new life. Now, I'm not suggesting that God directly causes change to come upon us, I'm suggesting that God never wastes a chance to draw forth new life from whatever circumstances that we are in. So get up, be raised, be resurrected. Lastly, do not be afraid. Oh, I need this one. Do not be afraid. I think you all need this too. (laughs) Because most of us, I suspect, live with some level of fear. Change often brings about fear, the fear of losing what we love, the fear of what, losing what we value and what we desire. And sometimes it's the fear that comes with getting what we want, right? Sometimes we get what we want and we actually end up in fear. And in the midst of change, Jesus says, 
Do not be afraid. This is the hallmark of the gospel of Jesus. Do not be afraid. Fear is a part of the common fabric of our lives, even though it manifests itself differently. And to all these different fears, Jesus' reply is the same. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And by saying that, he speaks to the heart of the human condition. They are the words we need to hear when we are raised up and back on our feet again. Now, his words, let me be clear, do not magically eliminate our fear. They don't. Instead, they are the call to take a first step into a new and changed life, despite our fear. They are the assurance, once again, that change does not have the final word. Christ has the final word. We are not called to be fearless. Instead, we are called to be courageous in the midst of change and fear. Big difference. Now, I don't know what changes you are dealing with. Perhaps it's your marriage or your children. Maybe it's the death of a loved one. Maybe it's about your health, your age, your physical or mental well-being. Maybe it concerns your work, your job, your income. Maybe it's a dream or plans that didn't work out. Maybe life is going exactly like you want. Maybe you're on a road to recovery, a road to well-being. Maybe everything has fallen in place and for the first time, you felt alive. Listen to him. Get up. Don't be afraid. What if those words are holy wisdom for times of change? What if they are the means by which we step into our own transfiguration from glory to glory? Maybe it wasn't Jesus who changed on the mountaintop. When he was transfigured, maybe it wasn't Jesus who changed on the mountaintop. Maybe it was Peter, James, and John. Maybe it was their eyes that were open and their seeing change. So they look everywhere and actually saw Jesus. They saw Jesus alone for who he is. So maybe they saw Jesus for the first time during that transfiguration as he had always been. Now, if that's true, and I believe it is, that it means that every change, whether good or bad, wanted or unwanted, joyful or sorrowful, is actually illumined with the divine light and filled with the presence of our Emmanuel, with God's presence. And so this morning, as we face a turning point, listen to him. Get up. Don't be afraid. Let's bow our heads. As we have encountered you, Lord Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we ask that you would give us the ability to open our ears so that we will listen to you instead of the many competing voices trying to overtake us. We ask that you would give us the strength to get up from our complacency, from the status quo that we are so comfortable in. And we ask that you would give us the courage to not be afraid. Thank you for letting us know that we don't have to be fearless. Instead, we just have to be courageous in times of fear. So speak these words of life again to us and transfigure us from glory to glory. For the glory and your purposes alone, we pray and give thanks. Amen.